A young director named George Lucas started uh, taking this script around Hollywood um, and nothing like it had ever been done before. There was no best practice, there was no, no formulas that you could plug into, there hadn't been any research on this kind of thing. Um, so there were very few takers, United Artists passed on it, um, all the major studios. When George Lucas pitched the idea to Alan Ladd Jr., by his own admission, he didn't actually understand or get Star Wars. He, he said it was, it was something totally new, but he had faith in George Lucas and in what George Lucas could create, having seen um, you know, some of his student work. So Alan Ladd Jr. and George Lucas actually went to the board of 20th Century Fox and said, look, we want to make this movie. Um, 20th Century Fox were extremely nervous. Um, they, they hadn't seen anything like it before and therefore you know, didn't know how to react. But Alan Ladd Jr. won, him, won them over. And they had, still had certain um, you know, research and best practice formulas to, to fall back on. They said, if you're going to make the movie, then we actually want you to use certain A-list actors that we know people actually like. But what Lucas said to these guys is he said, you know, we've taken people into, into this new world and to make these characters more believable, I don't want people to have any preconceived notions of who these um, characters might be. And he stuck to his crate of guns. Um, stories were kind of getting back to the board at 20th Century Fox that this was going to be an absolute disaster. So towards the end of the filming, Lucas actually discovered that they had decided they didn't want to lose any more money on this movie and actually weren't going to put any substantial marketing uh, behind, uh, behind the movie. Um, so he had to find a lateral creative way to actually get the word out there about, about Star Wars um, if he didn't have the usual you know, avenues open to him. So what he actually did was, he, before the movie was finished, it was actually about six or seven months before the movie was finished, he actually created a comic book of Star Wars. And he phoned up, um, he phoned up Stan Lee at Marvel Comics and actually said, <coughs> are, you, are, you, uh, are you willing to publish this um, comic? And what Lucas did was he actually went around to all the, the comic book conventions around America with this comic book, actually getting people um, you know, involved in the movie and drumming up um, ground support um, to actually get, get the word around that this movie was coming out. But he managed to get, um, get enough support going to such an extent that on opening day, when the movie actually was, was finally finished, um, it only, interestingly enough, it only opened in 37 theaters across America. Um, for that reason that 20th Century Fox really thought they'd, they'd wasted their money. Um, he'd actually managed to, to drum up enough uh, support from science fiction fans and comic book fans um, that on the opening day all these 37 theatres were actually totally um, you know, booked up. And what actually happened was uh, these guys were actually watching the movie four times a day. And Star Wars became such a phenomenon that people originally in the first, in the first month of, of release, people were actually driving from around America to these 37 theaters, um, you know, to actually go and watch the movie. Of course, at that stage, 20th Century Fox realized, shit, guys, we've got a winner on our hands here. Um, you know, let's get all the money we can behind it, um, and let's, let's totally capitalize on the Star Wars phenomenon. So within a few months, they started um, distributing, uh, you know, Star Wars, um, obviously nationally, but then all around the world. And when Lucas... When Lucas signed up for the project, he was given the $8 million to direct the movie. He was quite frustrated with that amount, and um, he actually said to them, what I'll do is I'll take a, a smaller director's fee um, in exchange for merchandising rights. And at that stage, no movie ever had really had merchandising spin-offs. Uh, nothing like it had ever been done before. So, of course, these guys didn't have any research or best practice to fall back on in terms of that, so they went, well... You know, this movie is not going to do well, and they signed over all the merchandising rights to George Lucas. The money that the merchandising made was actually more than the movie itself. The money that George Le Lucas made from the merchandising actually helped him finance all the rest of the Star Wars movies. Um, the money he made from the merchandising um, ensured that he could actually set up all his own companies. And it's just it's a, it's a fantastic story about how a creative guy. Um, actually you know, thought of a, a, a lateral solution to a problem he had um, and actually embraced the commercial side of things and, and came out on the side of actually becoming financially independent for the rest of his life in terms of making the movies he wants to make. 
a big misconception is that creativity and commerce always, you know, in opposition. And I think it's a great example of how, how he embraced it and, and made, it, made it work for himself. The first lesson we can take out is that research and best practice cannot be easily applied to truly original work. And I think, you, you know, we, we live in an age now where people are scared to take chances and it's, it's, it's totally understandable, but at some stage you've got to rely on your, on your gut and, 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 and trust uh, people for, you know, what, what you entrust them to do. And Alan Ladd Jr., like I said, was that guy. Um, you know, if Lucas had folded, we, Star Wars would be a very different thing and I very much doubt uh, 20th Century Fox would have had the, the hit that they had on their hands. And I like to apply this to, to advertising, and we've seen Star Wars on, on, on the big screen, and I hope this is giving you some idea of what it took to get there. But there's so many ads out there that people absolutely love, and would those ads have got through research? The, the head of Cadbury's marketing, actually, he wanted uh, to, to get some work out there that really captured the joy of, of chocolate. He felt there's something amazingly joyful and simple about eating chocolate. <laughs> the script and I, I just think it's absolutely amazing that a, a client bought that and, and they really reap the rewards. I've got all the stats here. Cadbury's brand awareness rose to 60%. Cadbury's share of the confectionery market peaked at 9%. Annual sales hit 360 million pounds, over 5 million viewings on YouTube, 100,000 blogs and message boards dedicated to the spot. So I just think it's a wonderful example of, of you know, client and, and agency working together and really, really brave work. Point number two, is creativity can be applied to find solutions when traditional media channels are not available. And as I mentioned, Lucas, you know, he went around to the, well, first of all, he published a, a comic book with Marvel um, to get people interested and then went to the science fiction conventions. Um, and we actually see this, you know, a lot in advertising. And there's this recent example, which is actually really amazing, done by an agency called BBH in, in New York. Um, the, the band uh, Oasis um, have been trying to crack America for, I don't know how long, um, without any luck. Um, and this agency came up with the idea um, of actually leaking Oasis songs um, to uh, street musicians. Okay? And before the, the month before the launch of the album, what they did was they actually took all these street musicians into uh, a studio and actually taught them the songs. Um, so every single New Yorker um, who went out into the subway, um, you know, in, in the highest density uh, frequented places was actually listening to Oasis songs with a little placard at the front that said you are listening to the new Oasis. Um, I've got a little clip here of it and I just think it's absolutely genius. I, I've never heard anything like it before. Um, point number three, creative is the art of discovering new worlds, not copying tried and tested formulas. And, you know, if we go back to the Lucas example, you know, best practice and research was showing these are the kind of movies he and to 20th Century Fox's credit, um, they let him create something that was, was totally different and, and had never done before. Um, a campaign my creative partner Andrew Whitehouse and I worked on um, years ago, about eight years ago, uh, was a campaign we did for, for Dulux. Um, and it was our first experience of, of having a client that was really, really brave and believed in what we were doing. Um, and she actually had so much faith in us that she actually went up against the entire board of Dulux at the time to actually create this work. And the, the platform was any color you can, you can think of. And you can imagine going from an advertorial <coughs> to that um, takes a lot of, lot of guts. Um, and that brings me to you know, point number four, all brave work needs a brave client. Because you, know, you can present the most amazing, amazing idea but you really need the, the faith and the trust of, of the clients you're working with. Um, finally, uh, creativity, you can get your disproportionate return on your investment. And um, I mentioned the, uh, you know, the budget involved with Star Wars, it was 10 million bucks. Um, this guy, uh, Lucas came up with this amazing idea and the movie made $273 million. Um, so it's an amazing, amazing result. Okay, and this really refers to, to Lucas here, you know, visionary creatives embrace commerce but at the same time fight for the independence and I think this is something I touched on earlier that it really frustrates us, you know, when, when people say, you know, creativity and commerce are at odds. It's creativity is the most powerful business tool you can actually employ. Yeah.